Good morning. It's Thursday, September 4th, 2014. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 52. My name is Chris, and whoa, whoa, a lot of things happened yesterday on our day off, but I'm back here today, and we're going to bust through some of the big stories that are developing right now, and to help us really get through all of it, I have assembled a unique team of superhumans assembled via an internet chat room called Mumble. Time-appropriate greetings, Mumble citizens. Good evening, y'all. Good evening. Hello. Hi. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, you guys. I think we're going to have a big show today because it's the pre-IFA storm. Now, if you're not familiar with IFA, maybe that's because you're not over in Germany. That might be why. Uh, IFA is sort of like a, think of it as a, a different kind of CES, maybe one that's a little more mobile focused that happens over in Berlin. It serves often as a launching platform for smartphone and tablet manufacturers. It also happens to have the benefit of giving them a bunch of PR right before Apple's traditional September uh, announcement, which they'll be having next week. So it's great from a trade show standpoint. It's great from a press coverage standpoint. And it's great from a timing standpoint. However, the funny thing is, is the conference actually runs from the 5th to the 10th. Well, that starts tomorrow. That doesn't stop all these guys from making their big announcements, though, so that way they can grab the headlines. And we've gotten a few interesting things that have come out of IFA already. So let's talk about a couple of those. The first one I think that people are probably going to see the most talk about is the new Galaxy Note 4. You have probably saw some of the headlines about the Galaxy Note 4. It just came out. It's a 5.7-inch screen. It's not available yet, but it'll have a 1440p Super AMOLED display. It'll be shipping in October. Price is not exactly set yet. That's not too surprising, but they also announced something that did catch my attention. The Note Edge. Anybody in the mumble room see the Note Edge or know what it is? It's a pretty interesting device. It's a lot like a Samsung Note 4, almost identical, except for instead of coming to an abrupt end like most phones, it has a curved edge on the right side that is a separate section of the AMOLED screen that can be controlled separately. Is that, what is, is something playing music? What is playing music? Oh, it's my, it's my Sailfish OS phone. <laughs> it's you. Speaking of phones, I have a Sailfish OS, so let's, let's answer and see who it is. <clears throat> Hello, this is Chris. No, thank you. Yes, no, I'm doing a show right now. Would you, oh, no. Oh, goodbye. They hung up on me. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, <laughs> that's a bummer. Well, anyway, so the uh, Edge Note here, if you look at it, it has an always-on Edge lit screen that has a separate set of controls, a separate set of icons, uh, and, and all in all, it is a standard Note 4 phone with some of these exceptions. It includes the heart rate monitoring, the same processor, uh, the super nice display, but it is slightly narrower. It's only 5.6 inches instead of 5.7 to make Edge for that so that room on the edge. It slopes downward. You can scroll through it for notifications and uh, and launchers. It, it requires the Samsung proprietary software stack for it to work. In the videos I saw of it, it actually looked pretty clunky to me. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I think The Verge might have a video here. I'm going to play a little bit of The Verge's video so you can see what the UI looks like. Hey guys, this is David with The Verge, and this is the Samsung Galaxy Note Edge. Basically, it's the same thing as the Note 4. It has the same processor, the same design, the same camera, the same S Pen, the same There you go. So you can see an There's action one there. one big change. It's this. It has a rounded oh, display that actually that is part is of the same weird. display. It's a little smaller than the Note So 4. let's pause it right here. But so you can see the way he has to hold... Oh, too bad The Verge puts up that big spammy thing. Uh, the way he has to hold it is he... And if you watch, I did. I watched the Samsung Keynote. You can't touch the sides. Of you can't touch that side or else you're activating buttons. So everybody who's holding this is holding it in a very funky kind of way. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and see if we can see him interacting with the UI of it too. And then you have little menus over here. Sometimes it's apps, sometimes folders will open. Sometimes it's contextual things like if you have the camera open. Dude, that's kind of cool. The shutter button and all the modes come down here. So basically it's designed to be sort of complementary, sort of separate and it's basically a whole other screen that you can choose to do whatever you want with. Samsung's done this before with the Continuum, which was sort of silly. This actually seems much cooler. So you can customize it by adding things like news and sports scores and Twitter and things about your steps and all this stuff. And what's going to be really interesting is when developers can actually get a hold of this and start to do cool stuff. My favorite thing so far, this is kind of small, is the alarm clock mode. So the idea is you set it down on your table as you sleep That's kind of neat. And it will just show you the time, and you can scroll through your notifications, you can scroll through your news. You see how it's not responding steps, to his touch whatever there? You, whatever you have while you're lying in bed looking at it. 
I don't know if that's cool. I'm kind of into it, though, so I don't know. I'm a fan. I like that I could check the notifications without having to turn the whole screen on. I like the alarm clunk, clock functionality because I do use my phone as my alarm clock. What I don't dig about it, and uh, this is I've seen it in a couple of videos hands-on, is and, and even when actually Samsung was introducing it up on stage, it uh, often was not responding to their touch, and they would like swipe on it multiple times, and then it would all of a sudden issue a series of events because it's now registering all of those tap events, and it just triggers off something you don't want at all. That would drive me crazy. So the implementation is key. The other major downside I see to it uh, is that you have to interface through the Samsung software. So you know Samsung has these developer events now because they're introducing a set of APIs and ex extensions for that Samsung TouchWiz UI that they put on top of there. And you have to write to that, not to Android, to interact with this thing. So that's a bit of a non-starter for me. So it's not cross Android. Of course, this is the only device that has this, so that's kind of understandable. And then last but not least, I, I think it's going to be really hard to hold it. I don't want to crap on it completely because I kind of like the idea of some aspect of my phone always being available to me, like, oh, it just vibrated. Do I really want to wake the whole thing up and pull down the notifications menu? Or do I just, if I could just scroll through the side of it a little bit and see them, I kind of dig that. But maybe that's the role the smartphone's supposed to play. It's cool. It's sexy and all. And the, the only thing is, you know, they've got that curved part that you can't touch while operating the rest of the phone otherwise you're gonna screw it up and also it just seems kind of gimmicky to me like they just did it just because they could yeah and the chat room points out too that if you're left-handed it could really be a pain in the butt oh yeah mm. i'm i'm left-handed and i'd hit that all the time yeah um yeah, left-handed version so is this a flop or do you think the, this uh, you know the thing about samsung is they try a lot of stuff they really yeah. do yeah they, they really push the envelope they push the envelope, and I think that people are going to dig it, but then in pra all practicality, people are going to start to hate it. I mean, other things that have note, uh, it still has a removable back, which is nice, but the back is more of a metal mesh now, which sounds kind of nice. It get, I guess it gives it a higher-end feeling. It also has a heart rate sensor, which is kind of cool for the uh, fitness stuff, including the fact that you can pull up your, like, your steps and fitness data in that little sidebar. So as you're walking around or whatever, you could just check your steps on that. I like it. I don't like the idea that it's a proprietary launcher that's only going to work with the Samsung TouchWiz stuff or, you know, have to require it. So that's kind of a non-starter for me because when I get an Android phone, I prefer the Play editions myself. But I could see maybe a CEO who wants to have something fancy at the, in the boardroom or, or the lawyer who wants to impress the client with some sort of phone that does something other phones don't do. This, this will give that element, and there is that aspect to smartphone purchases, the more fashion over functionality, and it's something unique that makes a smartphone stand out. So that maybe you could sell it for a few people, but you're not going to bust the market open with that. Something else Samsung announced. So we all saw this coming. In fact, we covered the rumor about a week or two ago on Tech Talk today. Samsung and its partner Oculus VR announced a virtual reality headset that uses the Note 4. So the Note 4 that we just talked about, you take that same device, you snap it into a hardware headset that Samsung has created. And now you have virtual reality. But here's what's unique about this, uh, say, as opposed to the Oculus VR, which is probably what you're wondering. It's using Samsung hardware. The software driving the VR is Oculus. It's even Oculus branded when you turn it on. It has a built-in camera, so the headset has something that's a little additional functionality than the Oculus VR does. It also has a touchpad integrated into the side, so you can select games from within the, uh, within the uh, VR headset environment. You don't have to launch them on a separate computer. It's also wireless. And if you're paying attention, it probably just clicked. That also means it's not connected to a PC at all. It's wireless. You activate the games from the headset directly. So the nice part is the immersion is better because you're not getting tripped up in wires. One of the problems with the Oculus that everybody that's tried it here at the JB1 Studios has ran into is they start walking around and it's, they think they're on the frickin' holodeck and they twist themselves all up in the cords. So this being wireless, I think, is a bigger deal than... Uh, probably you might think at first pass. However, not being connected to a PC, that means you're limited to the power of the games that the Note 4 can produce. That's a non-starter for me for this kind of thing. Yeah, it just seems like a competition for Google Cardboard, and I was just reading that in the article right there, too. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it is. I... You know, as maybe as uh, as these types of hardware uh, improve and the GPU can do more in these, in these uh, phones, then these games could be more advanced. And, um, you know, for some folks, especially outside the U.S., maybe this is their main computer. When you have a phablet that d is powerful enough, maybe when you want to have a more immersive gaming, instead of getting a console or a, 
or a gaming PC, you just buy this accessory Samsung headset and you do your VR gaming on the devices or your primary computer. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, it's really sexy. I, mean, I do like the idea. Um, it, it, I just find it's interesting that they're do, doing this kind of approach, whereas everybody else is kind of doing a different approach. I don't know. It's It seems really cool. I I'd think like it's good they're it working practice. with Oculus. I like that, too. Like, yeah. I think that's a good. I think that's a good aspect to it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. PC was. Go ahead. It'd be interesting if, um, like with the Nvidia Shield, you could do the game streaming to it. Maybe with the um, right. Steam game streaming. Yeah. yeah if Samsung could work with Valve to get a Steam client on there or something like that, that would be pretty cool. Uh, so the only information we have on this is uh, Samsung expects to ship it this year. No price yet. It's available for purchase online through select carriers, which is an interesting term, considering how low-tech it kind of is, although, because it, all of this is the big caveat, all of the computing guts require a Note 4, okay? So it's the, so there's a good and bad to that. That means the headset itself, maybe they could sell it for pretty reasonable price, maybe even under $100, because all of the all of the computing guts, all of the horsepower are in that Note 4. So you've got to have a Note 4. It comes with a 16 gig micro SD preloaded with a variety of uh, 3D games and trailers and uh, movies. Because it also works for 3D movies. Uh, and uh, you put the Note VR in there, it's good to go. It only works with the Note 4. And when you put it, the Note 4 in the VR headset, the Note 4 automatically launches into a VR mode. It recognizes it's in there through like a series of, I think maybe NFC and a connector that you put in there. And when you when you plug that connector in, the Note 4 transforms into a VR headset. It's kind of neat. All right, so there you go. That was from Samsung at IFA. One more kind of mobile-related story before we get out of the IFA stuff. Uh, because, you know, next, next week there's probably going to be a little more. And then, boom, on Tuesday... It's the Apple announcement, so let's give the Android guys their due share while we can. Sony announces its latest flagship smartphone, the Xperia Z3. I've heard from some of you in the audience that are really big Z2 lovers. So here's what you're going to get over the Z2. Uh, I'm not a particular Sony Android fan, so I don't get too excited about this. You're still going to have a 5.2-inch screen, 1080p display, Still rocking that 20.7 megapixel camera, although they've tweaked the uh, lens now. It has a wider angle lens. Uh, so that's kind of nice. And it also has an extra high ISO for light sensitivity. They put a 2.5 Snapdragon uh, gigahertz, 2.5 gigahertz Snapdragon 801 processor instead of the 2.3 that was in the Z2. And they have no word on price yet. One of the other things they did that's kind of interesting about the new Xperia is they think they've eked out some battery life savings uh, by tweaking the way the GPU uh, is assigned memory. Instead of using the same system memory that the processor uses, the GPU now has its own dedicated memory. I know, sounds crazy, right? But this is where smartphones are at. And now that they gave the S or the Z3 its own dedicated GPU memory, they say that it's using le- the, the entire graphics subsystem is using less battery overall and they actually took a couple of hundred milliamp off of the battery that's shipping in the z3 because of the battery savings they got by giving a dedicated uh dedicated memory to the gpu so the z3 could potentially have better battery life by doing that so i wonder if we'll see other smartphones do that soon as well all right our last story today guys this is the one i think you guys will probably want to chime in on because it sure gets me all worked up i hate seeing this kind of stuff you've probably seen the headline now because I, I, every news a- aggregator I follow for Linux news is, fo- is covering this. Uh, they say you might have seen a couple different iterations of it. Akamai says Linux systems are being compromised. Uh, here's another one: Linux systems infiltrated and controlled in a DDoS botnet. Linux vulnerability leading to DDoS botnet is another one I saw. Uh, Akamai says Linux is vulnerable. And if you're not familiar with Akamai, they're one of the major CDN providers on the net. A lot of big companies publish their content through Akamai. And uh, they have said that they're alerting enterprises to a high-risk threat of IP tables and IP tablet or I what is it IP tablex? I guess that's another kind of version of IP tables. I'm not familiar with it. They're saying that these uh, IP tables and IP tablex is there's an infection that is possible on Linux systems. Okay, that sounds bad. I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds really bad. An infection on Linux systems in IP tables. They say malicious actors may use these infected Linux systems to launch the DDoS attack against the entertainment industry and other verticals. Literally, quote from the article. The mass infestation of IP tables seems to have been driven by a large number of Linux-based web servers being compromised, mainly by exploits in Apache Struts, Tomcat, and Elasticsearch vulnerabilities. No, no. Now, hold on. Wait a tick. Wait a minute. 
it sounds like, hold on, <laughs> it sounds like it's vulnerabilities in Apache, Tomcat, and Elasticsearch. That's not the That's same thing. Linux. It's Windows. Nothing to do with Linux. Right, it could be on a Windows box. Now, of course, what's probably happening is they get on there, and these boxes have other vulnerabilities because if they don't have their Apache patch, they probably don't have any of their other packages patch. And then it's fairly trivial once you compromise the box using something like a remotely exploitable Apache flaw because Apache is listening to all remote connections on the internet. So you compromise that. Then once you compromise that, you can then likely get access to whatever user the Apache instance is running as. And then you leapfrog from that user to somewhere else in the system using an additional vulnerability because it's an unpatched Linux box. It doesn't, it's not like, it's not like code red. It's not blaster. Okay. It's not like there's a fundamental flaw in the operating system that every single installation of every Linux box has. It's if you have this version of Apache Tomcat and you haven't patched the rest of your system, then like any other piece of software on any other operating system, on any other architecture, if it's remotely listening and it's vulnerable, it can be compromised. That's how computers work. But everybody's running this as Linux systems infiltrated, part of a DDoS botnet. It drives me crazy. You might as well, I mean, it's uh, the same thing applies to an XP computer. The same thing applies to a free BSD machine. The same thing applies to a Mac, right? Patch your shit. There you it's go. It's just clickbait. Well said. <sighs> it drives me yeah. nuts. Well, and, and the other thing is, um, no, this is going to sound bacony. Um, oh, geez, really? Are you serious? Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's do it. Bacon. No, let's do it. It's the morning. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, so, basically... I'm thinking it's possible that maybe somebody, I don't know, some other competition to Linux paid them to say it was Linux. I don't think so. You don't see, think I so? mean, okay, here's why I could I could see that, but here's why I don't think so. I think it's the same reason why you always have Apple in the headlines. There's a few things you can put in that headline that's going to get people to click. And you, you know, they almost do it from, like, a self-preservation standpoint. They're not even doing it from, like, a, a dick trolling the open source community standpoint. They're doing it from, uh, we really need to deliver a certain amount of ad views to the advertisers because we've charged them for these ad views and we've got to get these numbers up. So, oh, my gosh, we've got to get some traffic. Oh, thank goodness, here's this story. Well, this affects Linux computers because people mostly run Apache Tomcat on Linux. So... Well, let's just call it a Linux story. And we're not really lying, and we're spreading information about something that's important that people need to know about, and we're also getting those clicks in so that way we can keep the lights on so we can keep publishing great content for people. You mean, could you see... It's also FUD. Could you see... But can you see, like, the self-circle jerk of justification there? Oh, easily. Easily. Oh, yes. And that's why I'm saying I'm, I'm, it, it is very fuddy to me. Sounds like a lot of FUD. Well, and then I think what happens is, is then I think it's so the conspiracy part, I don't think it's really a conspiracy. I think it's human nature. Then I think the different tribes and camps on the Internet where it it furthers their particular message or their particular agenda, then they kind of stoke it up. Right. They link it on their sites. They tweet about it. They talk about it. They they get it rolling. And sometimes that causes some steam. So there, it's not like it's so the the. The, the beast that needs to be fed, which is the advertising model that so much of the online publishing world uses, that beast then sort of entraps these tribes. These tribes, because it sort of revalidates that, that tribe's belief system, then go and use this as like an example of how, look at this, look how amazing this is. Look at, we've been all, haven't we been saying this? Just like I did, I, I just got on my soapbox on, on uh, Monday about uh, cloud security and bad passwords and two-factor authentication because that's that's one of my that's one that's one of the tribes I'm in and that's one of the causes I believe and I and so I when a news story comes out I jumped on it right and I I use that to prove my point just like somebody who might have an anti Linux agenda would but I'm not saying this story is originated because they have one I'm just saying they're opportunists that's human nature they jump on it it spreads like wildfire. Oh yeah, and this and honestly, FUD is going to spread from here on. You know, basically citing this article, the FUD spreaders that are in the Windows and Mac OS camp are going to be using this article to spread FUD like wildfire, like exactly what you're saying. And and computer security in particular, it's boy, I almost feel like FUD is 
it's too benign of a description because there is a very uh, uh, there there's free money in cybersecurity right now, and there's so much incentive for people to set up computers as these impossible to manage, too complex too scary, too much human flaw has gone into the system, they're impossible to be fully protected from, so the only solution for you is to pay my company thousands or millions of dollars to do audits, to do tests, to do penetration testing, to do recommendations, to engineer things for big companies that have to have, you know, big proof that we've, we did our full due diligence on this design. Like, there is such a an industry out there exploiting the fear around all of this right now that just anything that stirs this stuff up that adds to that narrative sort of gets boosted by all of that too it's it's like it's it's all like this big frenzy every time human errors still exist in the um companies who are trying to secure it yeah yeah yeah, exactly. Even those companies have human error. That's part of the problem, isn't it? So I was thinking, I'm sure we'll probably have uh, more on this in te uh, TechSnap because this is this particular problem is actually not new at all. Uh, unpatched Apache servers are often the cause of a Linux box exploit. It's, it's frequent. If you run insecure software on there, it's going to be a problem. Uh, it unpatched seems, though... anything. Yeah, so it seems like once they get in, they're able to gain privileges somehow from the Apache user and escalate it to allow remote, full remote control of the machine. They then are dropping malicious code into the system and run it. As a result, the system is then controlled remotely and added to a DDoS botnet if they chose so. A post-infection indication is a payload named .iptables or IP tab lex located in the slash boot directory. There's There are script files that then run .iptables binaries on every reboot. The malware also contains a self-updating feature that causes the infected system to contact a remote host to download the file. In a lab environment, an infected system attempted to contact two IP addresses located in Asia. We've traced one of the most significant DDoX attacks, they say, to a campaign in 2014 to an infection of IP tables on malware systems on Linux or malware on Linux boxes. This is according to Stuart Scholey, a senior VP, VP and GM of security business at Akamai. So this is all coming from Akamai, and they would they run they run a you know a, a crap ton of Linux boxes on the edge, and they work also with a bunch of customers who seed them content from Linux boxes. So Akamai probably has a pretty good uh, handle on large deployments of things that are happening on Linux systems. I'm sure they they watch that from afar, and they probably have literally tens of thousands of Linux boxes. So they probably see some of this stuff across a, a large swath of their system. So I would I would buy what they're saying. To me, it just sounds like poor system hygiene. Not not a Linux vulnerability. To me, it sounds like poor, um, <clears throat> you know, poor system hygiene as well, but also poor article writing. Well, for sure. Bas basically, they're taking what Akamai is saying about the Apache server and saying, "Oh, the Apache equals Linux. Oh my gosh, it's mm. open source. Oh my gosh." It's silly. You know, yeah, it's ridiculous. It is, it's really ridiculous. It's it's all it's it's unfortunate that it's not more. Um, if it was, if there was a way to get people to read it, but actually be more informative, it would actually help the problem. But when we, when we kind of cast it in these lights, we're not really sort of better informing the general public to be more educated about the right things. But also, we're not kind of encouraging this, the network and system administrators out there to focus on the right things. And I think that's kind of the unfortunate aspect because right now the focus is on Linux itself, which is this big nebulous term that could mean anything from a kernel to a full-fledged mainframe that's you know one of the top 50 supercomputers in the world. Like, what does that mean? But when you say you need to patch Apache and keep all of your remote listening services secure all the time, that's a much more uh, understandable concept for a system administrator and for the general public to wrap their brain around. And I think if we were discussing that, as opposed to discussing Linux or Windows has a problem, I think we would have more progress on this. But because we just sort of sit here and talk about it from a superficial level and we, show, we shove brand names in our faces, the conversation never really goes anywhere and it's unfortunate. And it's, it's, it sounds like something that the mainstream media would do, but yet it's the tech press doing it. And it's disappointing to watch. Exactly. And, and you know, also it's kind of like that ambiguous term HTML5 too. Yeah, there's a few of those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this is also a problem when it comes to um, well, some places can actually make you sell uh, server packs and operating system like Windows saying Windows salesman saying to a management that oh look Windows uh, Linux is vulnerable, so you should buy our secure system <laughs> yeah. and they can actually use this 
Oh, they will. Yeah, I've I've been in I've been in there where you know we'll go in to talk about uh, a, a doing a security audit, and we'll take something from the headlines if we know that client runs if it's a Windows day or if it's an Oracle day or a Linux day. Well, they'd take it from the headlines and be like, well, look at this. See, we can check against that. It's a imme- you jump on it immediately because people. The number one thing, if anybody works in IT, you will know. You could be saying, you could be advocating for three years, we have to fix our backup system. My God, we have to fix our backup system. And then when when someone important loses their data and they come to you and you can't restore it, and you say, well, remember how for three years I've said we need to fix the backup system? Well, then what happens the next day? They buy a new backup system. When they feel pain, when customers feel pain in IT, that's when they act. That's when they pull the trigger. So people jump I've had on that these backup thing happen. Yeah, it it it's it's or it could be anything. It could be more storage. It could be an, you need to renew the antivirus. It's anything like this. Anything. So we would take headlines and go in there right away while it's still fresh, while if it's still stinging or why they're still worried in the back of their mind about that story, and and you leverage that because that's how you get people to act. And so these stories are leveraged. They do do harm. I have seen it happen firsthand. I've been in those sales meetings. All right, but that's a downer, and it's not. This particular story is not. I mean, look. Here's the other thing, though: is Linux is so huge now that there's always going to be some Linux exploit because this is always going to be a problem. I think people will start to figure that out too. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to tell you about something I figured out that I love. You go over to Patreon.com/slash today, and I'll love you too. You can become a pledger to back the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. Three hundred and twenty-one of you have done a monthly pledge and said Jupiter Broadcasting is worth keeping on the air for me. Now you might have noticed I don't think the Patreon charges have gone through yet for this month depending on when you're listening to this episode if it's a day or two afterwards i i think they're doing some back-end changes i gotta look into that so don't freak out if you haven't seen the charge yet uh but you can go over there you can pledge any amount you can afford i have a default of three bones but more or less is fine it's a monthly charge the funds raised here are invested right back into the jupiter broadcasting network and that's that's really because our goal here is to diversify the income sources for our network so that way we're in it for the long haul. I've seen so many businesses on the internet that people think are going to be around for a long time and then something changes. And we had a scare um, late last year when uh, we had uh, an Amazon affiliate system that worked well because as folks in the audience would purchase from Amazon, a percentage of their purchase would be contributed to Jupiter Broadcasting. Amazon has changed the way they do their affiliate programs. They've actually sort of reverted some of it. But when they made the change, it affected us very greatly because it was it was sort of one of those things that we could budget and plan on. And I realized when that happened, we were we were surprisingly close to blowing it. I mean, it got it got really scary. And I realized I never wanted to do that again. So we have now a more diversified funding source. We're not de- too dependent on any particular one source. So that way we can be flexible. That way we can make any kind of changes we feel we ever need to make. But also that way we know we can be here for the long term and make some good plans and budget things, you know, like an actual business does. And you can help us do it. Patreon.com slash today. The funds raised there help every single show on the network. And thank you, everybody, who's backed the show. And don't forget, since we were off yesterday, we're going to do a makeup show on Friday. Special guest Angela Fisher, the wife, will be joining me in studio, and we'll have a Friday edition. So I'd love to have you join us live. Go over to jblive.tv, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, and uh, hang out in a mumble room with us. Hang out in the chat room with us. You know, talk with us and stuff. And also email us today at jupiterbroadcasting.com or... Submit your story ideas, your insights, your votes, your comments. TechTalkToday.reddit.com. All right, Mumble Room. Hey, guys, is there anything else we should talk about before we get out of here for today's episode? Keep watching for IFA. There's more stuff coming. It's going to be interesting for sure. Yeah. And then on Tuesday of next week uh, is the uh, is the Apple stuff. And I don't know what time it's at, but if it's kind of around when we would normally be doing Tech Talk, I'm tempted to just do live coverage of the event for that episode, and we'll do like Mystery Science Theater of the keynote. So that way we get sued by Apple. That sounds fun, right? Don't you guys want to get sued by I Apple? Always. Sure. Sued yeah. By Apple. yeah, I mean, that seems like something we should do at least. So I don't know for sure if that's what we'll do next Tuesday, but if you'd like to get in on that Mystery Science Theater aspect of it, you're welcome to join us. We'll have the mumble room open. We'll stream the, the keynote. machine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll bring the popcorn. Bring your own popcorn. Everybody BYOP. And uh, I think that it should be fun. I don't know for sure we're going to do that, but that's kind of my current inclination for next Tuesday. 
Uh, and then also we'll probably have a little more IFA stuff. I'm not super, I'm not like Mr. Mobile. So I'm just going to kind of cover like the big mobile stuff that matters. I'm not going to cover all the minutia. There's plenty of blogs out there doing that. But my current plan for any of the IFA stuff, is there anything else big? We'll talk about it. Otherwise, we'll let the blogs handle all of the little silly, shiny stuff. Okay, guys, speaking of silly, shiny stuff, I have a feeling next week on that Tuesday event that speech recognition is going to play a huge part of the functionality of a new device that Apple's going to announce. Based on a few things that uh, we've seen, they've recently renewed a partnership with Nuance, the people who are behind Dragon Naturally Speaking. That's what Siri and the text dictation is uh, powered by on the uh, Apple platforms. And they released an invite that said, we wish we could say more, kind of implying speech recognition. And I'm sure we'll all be told that Apple has reinvented speech recognition like never before and that it's magic. Well, turns out it was also magic in 1986. Speaking. It's one of the most natural things we do. It's also the basis of a remarkable research project at IBM. This is an experimental computer system that recognizes what I say. I talk, and my words appear on the computer screen. It has a business vocabulary of thousands of words, and it even knows the difference between words that sound alike but have different meanings. Watch this. Please write to Mrs. Wright right now. This computer system is another example of innovation at IBM. In fact, it's the most advanced voice recognition system of its kind, period. <laughs> 